We're in Acts chapter 21. It's the year 57. Paul had been an apostle since 34. He's been an apostle 23 years. Um, it's been 20 years since he visited Jerusalem for the first time um, as an apostle. Remember, he went, he was converted at uh, Damascus around 34. He went out into the Arabian desert for three years. And then around 37, he made his first Jerusalem visit. That was kind of hairy because the way we're scared to death did not believe transformation could happen, but it had. And he had to leave quickly, just a few days, maybe a few weeks. And they took him away because of the many, many plots that would ensue against his life. That's back in the year 37. We're now in the year 57, and we have just been with Paul through all three missionary journeys, uh, the way that, that they are accounted for. And uh, beginning with Acts chapter 13, and now we're in Acts chapter 21. In 21, he's coming back to Jerusalem after five years on the road with the third missionary journey. He spent nearly um, three of those five years in Ephesus, a very in, uh, important work, a very hard work. He just about was killed in that riot um, that was started by uh, the, the, the silversmiths in that, uh, in that uh, theater that we looked at last time. And he's had uh, revelations from the Holy Spirit um, that told him um, in advance, not the details, but the general picture that he's heading into trouble. And the last things we were looking at in the first few verses of Acts chapter 21, and I'm not going to read every verse tonight. I'm going to walk through, assuming you have been through it, you know it, you can go back to it, um, is trouble is coming. There's a storm on the horizon of his life. Um, Luke begs him not to go on. Luke's traveling with him. This is the third we section of the book of Acts. And he begs him not to go on. And Paul says, stop it, quit it. And so Paul arrives sometime in the spring, summer of the year 57 to Jerusalem, and he's checking in with the, um, the Jerusalem church, the mother church. Now, he's done this before. He did it at the end of the second missionary journey. Um, about uh, the year 49, you'll remember, he and uh, Barnabas, and they went to Jerusalem for a very important meeting over the issue of circumcision and the influence of the Judaizers. Um, Paul uh, is a Jew. He has not abandoned all of his um, Jewish rituals. We already knew that because when he left the work in the second missionary journey from Corinth, in the little harbor of Sancria, he cut his hair off. We find out that he had done a Nazarite vow. Now, what I didn't know, and I think I said this, did he do the entire ritual, which included taking the hair all the way back to Jerusalem to take it to the priest in the temple? We're not told anything about that. Was it a modified J Jewish ritual? Um, I don't know. But I do know that he still could be practiced without contradicting his, his, uh, his Christian practice and his, uh, his role as an apostle. He could still uh, observe some Jewish rituals um, as long as they, they didn't force them on Gentile converts. Um, that's, the, that's the key. You can't force the Gentiles to observe any Jewish rituals of the Mosaic law um, because it's not required. But there are some rituals of the Mosaic law that don't contradict conflict with his Christian practice. And it seems that to me that what you see in Acts chapter 21 and verse 17 through uh, 20, uh, 26 and I won't read all the verses, but I asked you to kind of two weeks ago if you would look at that. Some say that Paul, uh, for expediency, when he got to Jerusalem in 57, after being gone five years, to give a report to the church that there were some, a minority of maligners in the Jerusalem church that said he is teaching uh, Gentiles that he converts 
to not observe, but he's also teaching Jews to abandon their Jewish uh, traditions. He's teaching converts from Judaism to abandon Jewish traditions. And the Jerusalem elders, watch out here, James, the stepbrother of Jesus, and the elders are mentioned. They have a plan already in place as soon as he hits the ground in Jerusalem, fully knowing that something bad's going to happen. But the first thing he gets met with is, um, would you consider a order? Would you consider uh, observing a Jewish ritual to prove, to silence the critics, the few critics here in Jerusalem, uh, the Jerusalem church, which by now probably numbers in the 10, 15,000, uh, that still say you are teaching Jews they have to abandon all mosaic rules to conform to Christian practice. So here it is, I'm reading um, uh, verse uh, 20, the, the uh, James, the step, he's a leader in the Jerusalem church. By the way, my ESB footnote says that James may be an apostle. I disagree with that. I disagree with that. There's no evidence of it. But yes, a James, a stepbrother of Jesus, seems to be a prominent leader. Now, then it says James and all the elders were present. Okay, so obviously by the year 57, uh, maybe some of the apostles have uh, are not in town. They've left on missionary trips. That's possible. We really don't know. The life of other apostles, if you look at traditions, they go scatter all over the place from India to Africa, okay? But you can't rely on that, so on those sources. I don't know where they are. But in 57, who meets Paul at the return to Jerusalem after five years being gone, is the elders and the stepbrother of Jesus. And they say, we have a plan to silence once and for all your your um, uh, those that little minority of, of uh, not well, I might call them Judaizers. They've already lost the battle on circumcision and mosaic uh, eating customs. They lost that battle ten years ago, but now they want to say they they want to discredit Paul by making him uh, 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 teach something that he doesn't teach, which is you have to abandon all Jewish uh, rituals to be a Christian. So they ask him to take four men and go uh, pay for the finalization. Usually a Nazarite vow was about 30 days. In Paul's case, the one in court probably lasted a lot longer than that. But um, uh, usually it was there, then you would abstain from anything impure, uh, alcohol, strong drink, uh, grapes, sweet and fruit juices, um, and uh, you would let your hair grow out, and then you would cut your hair at the end of the vow. Uh, it was a vow between you and God, and you would signify it by taking your hair to the priest in, in the temple. I assume these four um, men did that. But Paul goes along with the request of the Jerusalem elders. He does not compromise. I insist. He does not compromise. Um, he finds uh, something that he can do without contravening. It's not being imposed on any Gentiles. They are ex-Jews that are part of the, no doubt, the church, and he can do that. He has done a Nazarite by himself recently, uh, so he actually pays for it. So here it is. Paul took the men, and the next day he purified himself along with them. I mean, verse 26, went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification will be fulfilled. Usually that was seven days and the offering presented for each one of them. Now, I do have to make one important qualification. This is not a sin offering. There is no way that Paul would uh, have anything to do. There are different kinds of offerings in the temple, and there's no way he would have anything to do with a sin offering. Um, no, no Christian that was converted to Christianity um, offered uh, animals uh, for their sins. Jesus was the lamb. Jesus' blood did it all. And so there were no sin offerings offered by people of the way, but they could still go a prayer to the temple and evidently uh, observe a vow to God um, by using the ritual, the Nazarite ritual, which had been 
around uh, and is, of course, in the Mosaic Law uh, too. So they could still practice that, but not enjoin it to anybody else or enforce it. So you and I, I'm not a Jew, by, so no, I don't use that. Uh, just like, uh, I guess in a sense, you might look at it as fasting, right? Um, Muslims require it. Jews require it. You know, the other two monotheistic religions. We don't. Not that I can find. But you can practice it if you wish. You, you can use it as, as a way of uh, uh, spending less time cooking. Spiritual things. Going to prayer instead of eating. Uh, whatever way you want to use it. Fasting is not enjoined on Christians. But it is um, one of the ways in which you might you might be able to pursue a, a, a spiritual moment. Uh, that's up to you. Any comments or questions here? Really? <laughs> you agree with me? <laughs> I thought you were going to accuse Paul of compromise. Uh, I was looking forward to uh, uh, sparring. <laughs> uh, but if that's clear, I'll move on to the rest of chapter uh, 21. So verse 27, here we go. I have just some images to describe the events. Look, you're looking at the model in Jerusalem at the, the Museum of the Scroll of the Jerusalem of the time of Jesus. And that's the 13 acres of the Temple Mount, the best reconstruction that can be had of what was there before the Romans destroyed it in 70 AD. That nine story high Holy of Holies and that gigantic sets of porticos, Solomon's portico. Uh, you're looking at the back of it and then the royal stoa, the royal portico at the end there to the right with that gigantic three-story high. And uh, that's where you could, and, and Jews and Gentiles could go in to this. There were 16 entrances on every side. By the way, the other side of the, tem of the uh, Temple Mount is the Kidron Valley. You're looking at a park bench, <laughs> uh, but that's uh, the model. Forget the park bench, okay? There's the Mount of Olives on the other side of the, um, in the real Jerusalem. And there's the um, Kidron Valley that Jesus and the apostles crossed every day to come into uh, Jerusalem. So um, verse 27 says, when the seven days were almost completed, the Jews from Asia. Paul spent three years in Ephesus. Ephesus, uh, sec the third missionary journey from 52, 53 to 56, uh, was a, the longest stop he'd ever made. And a church was established with eldership. And there were a lot of Jews that did not convert. Some of them were down in Jerusalem for the holiday. And they recognized Paul, who had left Ephesus about a year before. <coughs> but they recognized him. The large crowds. Imagine in these in these uh, huge courtyards here. Uh, Gentiles could go too, up to a certain point. There's a parapet, a wall. I'm going to tell you about that. And um, uh, there are signs everywhere in three languages. No Gentiles passed here. Penalty of death. Okay, it's in Latin, it's in Greek, and it's in Hebrew. We have found two copies of it. It's for real. Uh, so there's a parapet. Um, here's, look, you're looking at right now the Antonia Fortress. Let me show you. No, I don't have it. I'm sorry. I thought uh, going ahead I would find it, but I have to go back. Um, if you're looking at the center edifice where the courtyard of the men, Holy of Holies, the courtyard of the women, right in the middle of the Temple Mount, you're gonna see like a quadrangle, uh, a line, um, and that's a parapet that went up to about to the waist. And that was a little wall that uh, reminded of people, and you could only go in through a gate. Um, you don't happen to wander in here, okay? You just don't. The sign said, no Gentiles passed here, period. And the charge, that these Jews that did not convert in Ephesus, that remember Paul and know the discredit that he brought to Diana or Artemis of the Ephesians. Remember the selling of statuettes 
in honor of her. They were the keepers, the guardians of the goddess that was the most worshipped in all the Greco-Roman Empire. And this guy, with his teaching and his evangelizing, had brought to nearly a halt the business of selling statuettes to religious pagan visitors uh, because um, in the three years he was there, he had really made a dent into the um, uh, um, religion, uh, the worship of Artemis. And they resent him. They recognize him. They resent him. And so they accuse him of taking uh, a, a Gentile, Trophimus, in the wrong courtyard. And Paul would have never done that. There's no reason for Paul to do that. The irony is Paul has just uh, paid for the uh, Nazarite vow of four men. So he's just shown that when he can still uh, observe Jewish rituals so they can be useful to somebody or himself, then he's okay with that. And, he, and that gesture that, in a sense, silences the critics within the church, then uh, means nothing to these uh, Jews who um, hated him uh, from his stay three years in Ephesus and the impact he had had there in the Jewish community, and they accuse him falsely. Somebody said, I think I saw him with Trophimus, and there you have it. And suddenly you have a religious mob, a religious mob. Um, the description of here is that all the city was stirred up. They had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian with him in the city. They had seen him down in the city. And uh, they, they uh, uh, brought him into the temple, and they supposed that Paul had brought Trophimus to the temple. Paul did not bring him into the wrong courtyards. Um, uh, they seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple. They bring him out of the holy place, out of the temple mount, down one of those exits there. Um, dragged him out of the temple, and at once the gates were shut. So they're trying to uh, kill him right then and there a mob assassination, so to speak, in the name of God. Now uh, they're going to try to kill this uh, traitor. The Romans are used to this. That is, it just takes nothing to spark the anger of the Jews. So, but they are not, um, they are not um, micromanaging. The day-to-day, hour-to-hour security of the temple is administered by the temple guard, which is under the uh, command of the uh, high priest, and, and his name is uh, Cephas. And, and um, so where are the Romans? The Romans are in the, right there. They're in the Antonia Fortress. You're looking at it. It's on the north side of the temple. And uh, the best reconstruction that we can do right now shows you that they had a, a sight of what was going on. This is what's going to save Paul's life. Paul would have died right here in 57 had it not been for the Romans. The Romans um, will step in without asking questions in a second flat if they see a riot. And this is what breaks out. And so you see that there's uh, the best reconstruction of archeologists, there's actually a, a, a door that entered it. I don't know where exactly, but it looks like they got them outside of the temple. At least that's what the verse right before. But here is uh, the Roman tribune uh, who is sitting in one of the offices here of this Antonia Fortress with these four towers on the north side of the Temple Mount. And he is, uh, and I'm just teasing, uh, reading the morning paper and drinking his Starbucks coffee when suddenly somebody walks in and says, we got a problem down there. And of course, Jerusalem has swollen to nearly twice the size with religious pilgrims, and it's not a good time to have a mob in the temple. And so immediately, they're sent down the Roman guards to stop, and this will save Paul's life. Here it is. Um, as they were seeking to kill him, word came to the tribune, of the cohort, that all Jerusalem was in confusion. The cohort, by the way, was a thousand men, the best trained men there were. They all kept a low profile, but they were right there in the heart of Jerusalem, just on the north side of the temple. He at once took soldiers and centurions, ran down to them, and when they saw the tribune and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Now, I've called him commander. The text here, ESV, calls him tribune. Both are true, okay? He's a commander of a thousand crack troops. Some are uh, horsemen. Others are uh, spearmen. 
Others are, um, uh, well, the, uh, the, the legionnaires. Um, either way, a significant uh, military presence, but low profile until, and here they are, they're on the scene now, and they saved Paul's life. The tribute came in and arrested him. They don't have to read Miranda rights. Uh, they assume that he's responsible for something. He must have ignited something. They're going to put it out immediately. And um, here's the thing. They can torture. They can beat. They have a, the Romans can do whatever they want to. Unless, and here's the question. They are Roman citizens. What? somebody that's in the Roman temple, in the Jewish temple here, uh, a Jew, clearly. The Jews are angry at one of their own. Why would you expect him to be a Roman citizen? The tribune came up, arrested him, ordered him to be bound with two chains. That already, watch out, starts to be illegal, but it's chaotic. Um, look, look at what the text says. He inquired who he was and what he had done. Some in the crowd, verse 34, were shouting one thing, some another, and as he could not learn the facts because of the uproar, he ordered him to be brought into the barracks. The barracks is the Antonia Fortress you're looking at. So we've got to have some silence, some order. We've got to get to the bottom of, okay, why are they so angry at you in the wrong place? We do not need a riot in the temple. Not today, not ever. And since the temple guard did not stop it, the Romans step in and stop it. When he came to the steps, he was actually carried by the soldiers because of the violence of the crowd. Wow. They're trying to rip uh, Paul away from the guys with guns, the guys with weapons. They are um, just out of their minds. And this started with a false charge, remember. Paul will be, I'll remind you, for nearly five years under either house arrest or something like that starting from this moment right here. This is the trouble. This is the storm that he was being warned about. He's going to be not a free man to travel for five years. Next time he's going to be free is 62. Okay? He doesn't know it, but we know it. He doesn't know the time. He knows he just about died today because of false charge. He would never have taken somebody past that parapet, not a Gentile or not anybody that wasn't allowed. For the mob of the people followed, crying out, away with him. The anger of the Jewish mob um, is furious, and this has to be quelled. So here it is. Look at, please, the Antonia Fortress from another perspective. There are two entrances, one on the west side, one on the east side. Okay, uh, You're looking at the one towards the sea on the west side of the Temple Mount, okay? And uh, there's another staircase on the east side. I don't know exactly which staircase they're on, but Paul has an elevated position from which, bless his heart, a good Southern <laughs> blessing on Paul, okay? He wants to try to explain to those people that just tried to rip him away from Roman soldiers and tried to kill him in the name of God um, because he supposedly, and most of them probably don't even remember or know why we're trying to kill them anymore. A mob doesn't think, doesn't ask questions rationally. But he's on steps like the ones that you're looking at right down there, the Antonia Fortress. When he turns around and the commander, whom we will get to know, his name is Claudius Lysias. And I really like him. Um, he doesn't know it, but uh, his encounter with Paul of Tarsus is going to give him a headache uh, for a few days, if not for a longer time than that. Welcome to the whirlwind that is Paul. <laughs> um, he doesn't know him yet. He just knows that the angry crowd wants to kill him. Um, so here it is. Clausius Lysias is the name of the commander of the Tribune, who had his morning coffee interrupted by this early morning event here in the temple. And as Paul was about to be brought into the barracks, into the interior court, courtyard of those barracks. Um, he said, he said to the tribune, so the tribune Claudius lists there, may I say something to you? And he said, do you know Greek? So now you know what language Paul spoke. He spoke Greek. Claudius Lysias, I don't know how many, how long he had been there in Jerusalem. Those, temp, those assignments were normally temporary. But by the way, it was a very um, difficult assignment. It's kind of like with diplomatic court today, 
if you get assigned to Paris, that's cushy uh, as an ambassador. If you get assigned to Madagascar, that's not so cushy. <laughs> okay, you, you have military police around in a compound. Uh, you're not on the edge of the Eiffel Tower. So to get assigned as a governor or procurator or tribune to Jerusalem and to Palestine, it's a test of your mettle. And Claudius Lydia is going to pass it. He's a extraordinarily responsible Roman commander. Uh, I really like him. He saves Paul's life in a sense. And however, um, uh, he has a question. Do you speak Greek? He, he, he made some assumptions about Paul. He did not speak Greek. Uh, he and that's his main language, but he recognizes a very educated man just by the, uh, the way that uh, he says, may I say something to you? And he says, are you not an Egyptian uh, then who recently stirred up a revolt and led the 4,000 men of the assassins out into the wilderness? So he had made an assumption in the noise and the crowd and the chaos that's incorrect. He thought he was Egyptian and he thought he was a terrorist. And uh, Paul says, uh, no. You're not, you don't, you're not going to hear an Egyptian speak Greek like I do. That's basically uh, what you can see in the background. Paul replied, here it is. If you have 10 seconds to tell people who you are, what does Paul say? I am a Jew from Tarsus in Cilicia, a citizen of no ordinary city. I beg you, permit me to speak to the people. Now, that last part, let you want to speak to the mob that just tried to kill you? Here's what I think Claudius Lysias must have been thinking. Maybe you have a better idea. Maybe I can resolve this dilemma right here on the steps if uh, I let him do this, okay? I am not an Egyptian um, and um, I am from Tarsus, um, a citizen of Tarsus. And uh, I wanna speak to this crowd. Now, Paul is surrounded by Roman Roman spears and Roman Roman gladius clad legionnaires. Okay, so uh, they're not going to get to him anymore. The guns are out. But that said, if this can be resolved and he can go back to his Starbucks coffee, you know, maybe maybe we'll give it a shot. And then Paul begins. And in Acts chapter twenty one, here when he had given him permission, Paul standing on the steps motioned with his hand to the people, which is by the way a first century rhetorical device. You go like this, can I speak? It's kind of like grabbing the microphone. <laughs> so uh, let me talk here. Rhetorical device. Um, the schools of rhetoric of the time of the Greeks and the Romans, uh, you, your hand went up to speak. And when the, then there was a great hush, he addressed them and he switches from Greek to Hebrew. Of course he does. Hebrew language. It's interesting how Luke tells you that. He spoke Greek to the commander and Hebrew to his people, of course he did, and begins chapter 22. Now you already know what he says in chapter 22. We're not gonna read all the verses, right? But he's gonna, he's gonna have to get to, uh, he grew up in his city, he was a Pharisee, trained as a Pharisee, he spent years in Jerusalem, and then something happened. He's always got to get to the rest of the story, which is when his life turned, when it, he became, and he, he, so he, he tells, this is the second account in the book of Acts of his conversion. Paul gives it on the steps of the Antonia Fortress to an angry mob, and he makes it all the way to, um, look at verse, uh, uh, let's pick up with verse 17 of Acts chapter 22. When I had returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, I fell into a trance and I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly because they will not accept your testimony. And I said, Lord, they themselves know that in one synagogue after another, excuse me, let me pick up where, where he is. Um, uh, yes, um, yes, I am picking up. Verse, th verse 20, in Acts chapter 20, 22, sorry. When the blood of Stephen, your witness, was being shed, I myself was standing by, approving and watching over the garments of those who killed him. And he said to me, go, for I will send you far away to the Gentiles. Paul gets in his description of what happened on the road to Damascus in his conversation with Jesus, where Jesus gives him his job description. Jesus says, he quotes Jesus, the Messiah, according to him, says, you need to go to the Gentiles. And 
This is it. He, he's interrupted. Now, let's get this straight. All through the Old Testament, the Jews were supposed to go to the Gentiles. Jonah goes to the Ninevites. God always meant for it to go to the Gentiles. But in the context that we're in, the Temple Mount, the Roman soldiers, they are the overlords. This is just, uh, um, it's, uh, uh, they, are not, they are not thinking. They're not thinking theologically. They're not thinking historically. They're just reacting politically. And the Romans are there with their guns and reminding them that they're not really free and they have to pay Roman taxes. And as soon as he says, God said, the Messiah said, that I... that's it. They interrupt him. Verse 22, to this word, they listened to him. Then they raised their voices and said, away with such a fellow from the earth, for he should not be allowed to live. And they were shouting, throwing off their cloaks into the air, flinging dust. The tribune ordered to be brought. Now, stop here a second. Think, uh, look at it from the perspective of Paul. Okay. So he thought he was an Egyptian. He saved his life with his soldiers. He decided to give him a shot there on the steps of the Antonia Fortress. And then, and then he says something amazing. He says that the God of the Jews, Jehovah, told him that he was supposed to go to the pagans, to the Gentiles. Claudius Lysias is a pagan. He's a Gentile. And that sparks again the anger of the mob. And so uh, Claudius Lysias must be putting his hands in his hair going, what on earth? It's like the world is backwards. What's going on here? Okay. And he's got a problem on his hand. He cannot let this man be killed right there on the steps of Tony Fortune. He's got to uh, calm this riot, this mob again. And so the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks, saying that he should be examined by flogging. Typical. He assumes he doesn't have Roman citizenship. So he says, uh, tie him to a post, uh, lash, give him a few lashings, and let's figure out why on earth all these angry Jews are angry at him to find out why they were shouting against him. When they had stretched him out for um, the, when they had stretched him out uh, for the whips, Paul um, then, and the commander has gone back to his office uh, to finish his coffee and take uh, three aspirin. Um, the, 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 the elite, the uh, centurion that's in charge of the whipping that is tied into the post in the middle of the Antonia Fortress, gets this. Uh, here it is. A rhetorical question that Paul says. I wonder what language he spoke to the, to the centurion. Spoke in uh, Greek, I would have supposed. Maybe even Latin. Okay, I don't know. Greek. For, is it legal for you to flog a man who's a Roman citizen and uncondemned? That's rhetorical. You're about to violate my rights as a Roman citizen. I recommend you not do it, is what it's implied. Paul does not need to take a beating today. No purpose. Remember back in Philippi where he took one? I suggested to you that he may have taken it on purpose to gain some advantage. But today, no advantage, only a whipping. And so he says, it's not legal for you to whip me. You can't do that. I am one of those that has the rights to say those magic three words. Chivis Romanus sum. I am a Roman citizen. And so what happens is the centurion runs to the office of Claudius Lysias, tells him uh, he claims he's a Roman citizen. Claudius Lysias thinks, oh, he's just scared. He's just thinking he can avoid it or postpone it. But by the way, do you remember the punishment for claiming to be a Roman citizen falsely? It's called death automatic sentence. So it comes back to him and says, tell me, are you a Roman citizen? And he said, yes, uh, just simply yes. <laughs> the tribune then says, wow, I had to pay a high price for mine. You find out that the Roman commander in Jerusalem had to buy his. Uh, for a, at a high price. And Paul says, um, I am a citizen by birth. It's as if he goes, ah, and goes like that. I got mine for free. <laughs> I'm sorry you had to pay for yours. My dad gave me mine. 
his dad or his grandfather, it can only go back a generation or two. This is a situation at the end of Acts chapter 22. So, um, end of Acts chapter 22. Paul on the next day, desiring to know the real reason why he was being accused by the Jews, he unbound him, commanded the chief priests and all the council to meet, and he brought Paul down and set them before them. So, here is um, moment number three. This is the Antonia Fortress again in the images. You see the two um, staircases. I think it's probably the one on the west side, but you're looking at the one on the east side, right here to the left. This is a dramatic moment. And now we are the next day, and um, Claudius Lysias sends out an email. The mob is gone. Now it's going to be the Jewish leaders who are going to be um, on call. So he sends out emails to all of the Sanhedrin and says, we're going to have a meeting. You guys got to tell me what the beef is with this guy has Roman citizenship. And so, uh, right, um, you're going to have to lay out the charges in a trial, in a public setting. Uh, I need to know if there's anything that will stick by Roman law. And that's what and he's, he goes before the Sanhedrin, beginning with Acts chapter 23. Let me stop here. And do you have any comments, questions, anything you want to add? or? Yes, Paul. I've always uh, wondered why Paul is uh, so, uh, can it be skittish to say that he's a Roman citizen? Because like you said, uh, Philippi allowed them to beat them first. Here, he could have even said uh, right at the beginning, instead of talking in Greek to uh claudius he could have just say hey i'm a i run a citizen Good and uh, i always wonder i always wonder what was the motivation uh to that i don't know <laughs> okay that's number 476 i'll ask paul when i get there <laughs> okay okay why did you, okay we'd have to guess um if you have VIP status in the world. When he does, um, you are um, uh, the Italian word keeps coming. What's the English word? Um, restio. You are slow to use it. Yeah. Um, you know, you have certain rights. Like, for example, Paolo, uh, you like soccer. Right, you better. <laughs> <laughs> what if, what if, you know, you were born and your your father? Uh, who's your favorite team, by the way, Paolo? Milan. Oh, Milan. I'm sorry, yes, they've lost two games in a row. I'm sorry. I know, but hey, I was born there. So okay. Um, what if your father had gifted you in his will uh, box seats? In the stadium, is it Meazza, um, mm -hmm. Di Milano? Yeah, yeah. And you Meazza. had that, but uh, mm -hmm. you can't take everybody. Uh, would you always go watch the game from there, <laughs> or would you? I don't know if this is a good comparison, but would you go down among the fans in the you know, most rabid, uh, you know, curve of of the stadium? <laughs> I don't know why Paul didn't. You start with that is what we are asking. I don't know. But now uh, there's no sense in taking a beating yeah. because it would serve no purpose whatsoever. So clearly uh, he uses it here. Okay. Uh, good question. Anybody else? Ms. Sandy. I mean, I, I, um, it blinked out when you were talking about how many troops the, the man had. Did you say a thousand? A thousand. Yes. Wow. Okay. Yes. And that's a pretty sizable military contingent. A normal legion of Rome, Rome had about 30 legions throughout the world, was about uh, 6,000 each. Okay. But those were uh, parked out in various regions to keep, uh, and some were still conquering. By the year 57, uh, Roman legions will still be on the move, conquering the Gauls and many other. Uh, the Vatians and others up until the year 120. So they had 150,000 of the best trained in the world. And then they had another auxiliary force 
of non-Romans that fought for them, that number nearly 180,000. But Jerusalem had a contingent with a commander in the Antonia Fortress of about 1,000. And that was remarkable. That's not what Rome did all the time. But this is, this is how they would, Jerusalem was different than any other city. Uh, if, if ever there was going to be a rebellion, it's going to be from here. And by the way, <laughs> wait about, uh, uh, well, it's going to be 66. Wait about nine years, and the, the Jews are going to rebel from here, the zealots, from here. So they, were, they had a reason to keep. They were persnickety. They got really offended quick by any religious thing. And, um, and there was a sect that was called the zealots who believed in armed conflict in the name of God. Now, who didn't believe in it were the Sadducees, who were in cahoots with the Romans. Um, and they had a temple guard, too. So, um, Any other comments? Uh, Mark, did you have anything? Or Okay. Thank you for your question, Miss Sandy. So I love chapter 23. Oh, you, you gotta, gotta see that. And I, there's a couple of options to how this plays out. Um, chapter 23, looking intently at the council. Look at this. He wants to try to pour his heart out to the mob on the steps. But the next day in front of the Jewish leadership, forgive me if I'm wrong, correct me if I'm wrong, Paul has absolutely no intention of playing their game. None, zero, nada. <laughs> He is not, you know, you might accuse him of, you're lacking respect. I mean, this is a Supreme Court. Even if you, we have a Supreme Court of nine people. You know, um, you can like five of them and not four of them, okay? But still, their black robes in the setting in Washington is pretty austere. And whether you agree with their appointment and their, their decisions or not, there's a certain respect that is due, right? Now, did Paul abandon um, respect here? What happens? Look, he is supposed to get permission to speak. You're supposed to get permission to speak. He doesn't wait for permission to speak. Look at this. Looking intently at the council, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. Boom. He just fires the gun out. And he doesn't have the right to speak yet. He just says, I'm innocent, and you know it. That's it. Well, Ananias, the high priest, he reacts like, like you would expect. <laughs> okay? Ananias, high priest, commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Paul gets a slap by the guards that are next to him. These are the, uh, I don't suppose the Roman. It must be the temple guard. Okay? Paul... <laughs> I mean, this plays out in like 10 seconds flat. Paul says back to the high priest of Israel, he says, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting there to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Wow, this is going downhill so quick. If you had been the lawyer of Paul or the advisor of Paul or the friend of Paul, you said, no, 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 Paul, no, 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 no. <laughs> No, no, you may feel like saying that. Don't say it. He talks back to the high priest. How dare you? He calls him whitewashed. You know what that means, right? Um, you know, if you want to make an old decrepit house look good, you give it a good coat of paint, right? <laughs> you can cover up uh, the cracks, the termites. <laughs> you can cover up. Uh, he's basically calling him, you're like a grave. You look good on the outside. You got marble and you painted and you got it. And underneath that grave, and by the way, that's an illustration Jesus will use. You Pharisees and Sadducees, woe to you. you. You are like graves. You are corrupt on the inside. You look good on the outside. Man, you got the, the pomp and circumstance. You got the robes. You got the VIP status and power. And you command me to be struck. How dare you, Paul says back. Those who stood are taken totally aback. Those who, probably the ones that slapped in it by order of Ananias, they say, would you revile God's high priest? Now watch out, two options here. Um, look at what the text says, two options. 
Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was high priest, for it was written, it is written, you shall not speak evil of the ruler of your people. I'm going to give you two options as to how this can be read. What did Paul do? What did he say here? I already suggest to you strongly, I think he has no intent to cooperate with this a trial here. None. He knows it's just fake. They've already decided it's, it's not going to be conducive to anything. So he doesn't play by the rules. And so he, yes, talked back to the high priest. Now, what does he say here? Somebody said he had bad eyesight. So he didn't recognize the high priest. Is that what happened? He said, oh, I didn't know that was the high priest that talked to me. Because the scriptures, the Mosaic law says, you shall not. You shall not speak evil of your ruler. Now that's option A. He has thought it was the highest priest. Option number two, he knew exactly who he was talking to. He was saying, how would I know you're the ruler of the children of Israel? You're denying the Messiah and you are ordering me struck. You are not uh, serving the cause of God. You are not the people's high priest by the way you live, act, and the way you reject Jesus the Messiah. So that's my take. I think Paul was being ironic. He was using biting irony. Now, this is unusual for Paul, so I may be wrong, but this is my suggestion. Paul says, how would anybody recognize by your actions that you are the God's high priest? How would we know that? By your robes? By your throne that you're sitting on? How about by your conduct? By your, by your recognizing the Messiah? By recognizing the message that I have? And then look at what happens in verse 6. <laughs> this is like the... Uh, here's where I think I'm right in that second theory I gave you. He was being ironic. He was saying, I'm not going to cooperate with this court. Now, please look at look in the eyes of Claudius Lysias, who's witnessing all of this. He thought today he would resolve finally this issue of this man named Paul. And he would go back to his office and have the rest of the weekend. That's not going to happen. But he, he, he grows in both sympathy for Paul, because I cannot imagine Claudius Lysias can stand the high priest or the Jewish Sanhedrin. He he plays politics with them. He's respectful. He's got his job. They got theirs. But now they're at conflict over one man. And they hate him. They hate him. They, they are just as bad as the mob outside. They're supposed to be the educated, sophisticated men of God, the religious leaders, the high priest, for crying out loud. And they order a guy to be struck. And, and then he watches Put yourself again in the eyes of Claudius Lysias as he watches Paul again speak without permission. And Paul says, when, when, look how Luke puts it. I love how Luke puts it. When Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, like Paul didn't know that. <laughs> he was one of them a few years back, right? He was one of them back in the, the year 34. He was a young you know, Pharisee that was part of the Sanhedrin, he was in the high court. He knew exactly they were composed of the two major sects. Well, what did he do? He says, he cries out, brothers, he's using the word in the Jewish sense. Brothers, I am a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee. It is with respect to the hope and resurrection of the dead that I'm on trial. Boom. And it's like a verbal hand grenade. Paul takes a hand grenade that he knows he has, a verbal one, out of his sack, pulls the pin, and throws it out into the room. He says, let's see, what subject can I bring up, theological subject, that the two major parties disagree on? Oh, by the way, I was raised a Pharisee, son of a Pharisee, and I believe in afterlife and in angels. Anybody here agree with me? Well, that would be the Pharisees. They all go, ooh, and he's a Pharisee. And the Sadducees go, oh, <laughs> oh, how dare he? Now watch all this happening through the eyes of Claudius Lysias. He's going, what, what, what? No, 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 no. This is just, 
exploding out of his control, okay? When he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The assembly was divided. Here, imagine Claudius Lydia just putting his hands on his head and his hair and going, what on earth? He has not seen the Supreme Court look like a bunch of two and three-year-olds on a playground fighting over a toy. Um, this is what they look like. They look like a bunch of uh, angry children. Uh, these are the religious leaders of Israel. Well, the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, no angels, no spirits, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party stood up and contended sharply. Uh, we find nothing wrong. I love that one. <laughs> There's some of the Pharisees go, I like the guy. I think we should let him go. He's fine with us. You know, it's kind of like, uh, well, using the soccer metaphor, uh, from Milano, where Paolo's from, you're either Milanista or you're Interista, <laughs> and you're that rabid for life. You're either Auburn or Alabama last weekend. Uh, Mark, who you root for? <laughs> Is your world divided sporting wise? No. No. <laughs> Miss Sandy, are you an Alabama fan? Yes. You are going to face Georgia next weekend <laughs> and Auburn. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I'm, um, I'm for Alabama, says Paul. And all, all the Alabama fans said, I like the guy. And the Auburn fans say, boo, <laughs> boo. And there you go. So, wow. This is remarkable. This scene here, I think, is totally let me imagine something for a second. Now, humor me, okay? Paul looks over at the eyes of Claudius Lysias, and, and he looks down and goes, you see what's going on? You see these guys? This is the Supreme Court of Israel, okay? And they're playing like a bunch of two- and three-year-olds on a playground. And by the way, half of them forgot they wanted to kill me two minutes ago. You think they're motivated by just cause, and this is this is Claudius Lysias, okay? He's going, what on earth? And he's going, oh, this is not working. <laughs> Got to get him out of here. Look at that. Uh, when the dissension became violent, the tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away among the, them by force and bring him into the barracks. So now Paul's back in his room in the barracks. Claudius Lysias is back in his office, and he's just taking six aspirin now. Uh, because he's going, what on earth am I going to do? This is day two with Paul, okay? <laughs> day two. <laughs> oh, boy, oh, boy. Look at the last part of uh, verse 11, the following night. This is kind of a reminder. Paul, you know, looks so courageous in front of mobs and uh, they want to kill him. And uh, Supreme Courts that, uh, you know, when I tear him apart. But he does get discouraged, verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. And of course, then there's the next day. Any comments or questions?